Once again, welcome, and it's an opportunity that I am grateful for to be able to speak to you and uh, to finish up this series on worship that we've done. This will be a call to worship number three, and so I wanted to to say that I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity that I have. Uh, before we get too far in, though, I do want to share a word with everyone before we get uh, into the message today. Uh, and that is that the elders are extremely grateful for the men outside of our church who have been involved in the pulpit supply. We are grateful that these men have been willing to give up time where they normally worship to minister to us here at Covenant filling the role of pulpit supply has met a crucial need for our church. As a reminder, these men are helping us as we wait on God to provide the next man to lead us. The elders and search committee will always make you aware of a time when we have a person in to candidate. To date, we've had one such person, Isaiah Combs, and as with Isaiah, We will make you aware if we have a man who has progressed with the procedures used by the pastoral search committee. At this moment, the committee does not currently have anyone else in that situation. And so I would ask that you would just continue to pray that the man that God has for us would be revealed in his perfect timing. As we jump into this message then right now, let's open up with a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father God, we thank you for this day, and I thank you, Father, for the opportunity that I have to be up here and to share your word. God, I pray that you'll just be with each of us today. God, just use me, and Father, as I pray you do that, that you'll also just be with those who are here and open up hearts and open up ears, God, that your word might go forth. So, Father, we just pray that you'll bless our time together and that all things you would be lifted up and that, God, you would be glorified today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today is the third of a three-part series on worship. The first time we gave a broad overview on what worship is. The last time that we did this, we focused on individual worship. And this time we'll bring the last in this series, and our focus today will be on corporate worship. And so here's the glue statement that we introduced to bind all three of these messages together as put together by one commentator, and it is this. Worship is the central act of the church and the chief end of the Christian life. It's a pretty good expression. I mentioned last time that I wish I could claim it as my own, but I cannot, so I'll just borrow it. Over the course of the last two messages, we provided some definitions for worship, and so I'm going to remind you of those now since it's been a while since I've spoken. Uh, This is what we talked about as coming from Merriam-Webster, Reverence offered a divine being or supernatural power, an act of expressing such reverence, or a form of religious practice with its creed and ritual, and then this one, an extravagant respect for or admiration to or devotion to an object of esteem. For example, worship of the dollar. And so that's what Webster has to say for it. We agreed that the object of our worship is God. And we further agreed that the only way to know him is through his son, Jesus. In each of the previous messages, we also asked three questions about this. We said, who says we should worship? We asked, why should we worship? And we asked, how should we worship? We gave the very obvious answer for who says. God says. Pretty obvious, not much there that we had to worry about. We did spend a good uh, deal of time going over some of the scriptures, though, and looked at the multiple uh, array of scriptures on how um, we did that. And so we won't dwell on that today. We also spent a good deal of time on the second question, on the why, with multiple scriptures, and so we'll not cover those today. And so if you're here and you've not heard any of those messages before, I'm going to take the opportunity now just to to point you in the direction of our church's YouTube channel. All of these sermons, as well as all sermons here at uh, Covenant, are, it's kind of funny, I almost said at Thurston High School, that's my other job, Uh, uh, here at Covenant, are recorded. And so you have access to all of those, and you can kind of look what those are uh, on our church's YouTube channel. And that took us to our final question of how. 
And that's where we spent the majority of our time in our last message. And it's where we're going to spend some time today. In the first one, we looked at it from the perspective of the individual. And today, we're going to be looking at it through a corporate eye. We can worship through four different ways. These are the ways that we discovered and we talked about the last time that we were together. We can worship through obedience in service. We can worship through giving homage. We can worship through celebration. And we can worship through proclamation. And these are common to both individual and to corporate worship. The last time that we were here and talking about this, we observed, we saw, we talked about the special relationship that an individual is afforded when they worship. And so let me then tell you that we have that same thing today. As we jump in, let me apply that glue statement to you one more time. Worship is the central act of the church and the chief end of the Christian life. So as we looked at the chief end of the Christian life last time, we'll work at, look at the central act of the church this time. That special relationship that we talked about is one that exists with the individual and their God. And it's an amazing thing, and we spent our message last time talking about it. So today we'll look at it through this idea of corporate worship. And so I'm not sure how I came upon it, but I found an old Swedish proverb, and it says this, a shared joy is a double joy. Hmm. A shared joy is a double joy. And so when we consider coming here, you ought to be able to have an expression of and a feeling of joy for having come here. And so a shared joy is a double joy. I kind of like that. So let's look at the first ways that we can worship through, and that would be obedience in service. And so for that, we're going to go to a familiar passage. Uh, you would probably be surprised if we didn't go there. We'll go to Hebrews chapter 10. It's a great jumping off point for us. And we'll go through verses 23 through 25. So in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as the, you see the day approaching. Paul, speaking of a faithful God, inspired by his Holy Spirit, gives us an admonition. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Paul gives practical reasons for coming together beyond worship. The preaching of God's word should have an impact on us. He shows us that when we come together in worship, we are helping each other. There's a direct benefit of coming together to worship that you just cannot get if you forsake assembling together. The impact of sitting under the preaching of God's word is something that should be visible in our lives and how we treat and love each other. And yet it's hard to consider each other if we don't meet to see each other. Now that kind of is a logical thing, is it not? You know, if I don't see things, I often don't think of them. And while that may not be great, it's nonetheless a reality of the life that we live, the business that we have. And so to rectify that, we need to be here. We need to be in each other's presence as part of that. The second part of Paul's admonition is that we exhort one another. We are to build each other up, to be an encouragement to each other, to provide comfort and at times consolation for each other. We are to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to each other. Again, these things are hard to do if we forsake assembling together. It's very difficult for you to minister to somebody who isn't present. And it's even more difficult for you to minister to somebody if you're not present. And so we want to make sure that we aren't 
forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Another great passage that speaks to worshiping through obedience and service can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul describes the church as the body, the body of Christ. And so we'll be looking at verses 12 through 26. However, I'm leaving out a few of the middle passages just to kind of edit for some time and for some space here. Uh, but we're going to be looking at obedience in service. And so, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And here we drop down to verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. That's a lot. That's a big passage. And we're not going to do a verse-by-verse verse study of this passage, because if I did, I'd have to give you a whole other message. <laughs> that is a whole thing all by itself. And so all I'm going to do today is just grab a few ideas out of there uh, so that you can get home before midnight. The first idea here is that we are all separate, but we're all part of the same body. We're all individuals. There's not one of us that is exactly the same. I've not, since I've been here, seen identical twins here. Not to say that there haven't been in time. I've not been here that long. But even if they were identical twins, we only use the word identical to help us. Is it truth? Are identical twins actually completely identical? They're not. They're not completely identical in the way they look, nor are they completely identical in the way they act and the way they behave. They are separate. They are different members. Yes, there are a lot of similarities, but they are separate. So we also all are separate, but we're part of the same body. There is to be one unified body of Christ filled with different members. The second idea is that each member is important. Each member plays a vital role within the body. So we just went through this whole passage. It flashed on the screen before you, and hopefully you read through it. And so, pop quiz. Which verse was my favorite out of all those? I know you probably can't know that, but I'm going to share that with you. My favorite verse out of all of those is this, verse 18. But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Oh, man, what a verse. There is so much of this said here. It seems like an unassuming, just kind of thrown in there verse, but this verse is packed. But now God. Even that phrase of this verse, it, it says so much. No matter what else, God. All of this, but now, God. You can worship just on that one little phrase right there, but now, God. It's an amazing thing. This little phrase has big meaning. This phrase speaks to the sovereignty of God. God being on the throne, God being in control, God being above all, because all of this other stuff but now, God, that should give us such great comfort and such great joy. 
but now God. God, in his sovereignty, then, has placed you here. And get this, it pleased him to do so. It pleased him to do so. It pleased him to place you here. He is not a God of random chance, which means then he has a purpose. God always has a purpose. He has a purpose for you here. So, I hope you've figured out what that is. If not, you have some homework to do. Figure out what that purpose for you being here is. And then ask the question for those of you who do have an idea of what that purpose is. How are you doing and fulfilling that purpose? Because it's one thing to know what it is, but it's not enough. If you have a purpose, then it becomes upon us to fulfill that purpose. What part of the body are you? What part of the body are you? When God gives us gifts, the expectation is that we use them to worship him and to glorify him and to bring honor to him. If you have a musical talent, why were you given it? To worship him and, and to help others in that same manner. If you play an instrument, play your instrument for his glory. But in doing so, you give others the music to sing to so that they also can worship. And just kind of as a by the way, as we talked about those four different ways that we can worship through, you can put singing in every one of those. You can put singing in every one of those. We're talking about it right now here in this idea of obedience and service, but you can put it in every single one of those. Use your voice. Join the other voices like the heavenly multitude praising God. Hmm. That's something, isn't it? If going in a different direction, God blessed you with money. And tithing is also form of worship following the example of the early church in acts chapter 2 now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as everyone had need i don't know if you caught this or not did you see this this kind of first part of this now all who believed were what were together were together. All who believed were together, corporately worshiping the Lord, and in this instance, giving. And by giving, allowing the church to serve the needs of the body. So do you see this? All of these, singing, giving, serving, these are all a beautiful picture of of worshiping through obedience in service. We are all together part of the body. And if we choose to forsake the assembly, that part of the body that God was pleased to place here cannot accomplish its purpose. That doesn't mean that we don't have times where we're unable or where we have other things going. So this isn't talking about missing a Sunday here or missing a worship service there. This is talking about those who have forsaken the assembly. That's who we're talking about. I don't want to dwell on that too much. I want us to be able to move on. And so we look at the next point that we have in this. And that is that we can worship in giving homage. If you recall from the last time that we were together, we defined homage as a show or demonstration of respect or dedication and showing a reverential fear of God. And one of the ways that we give homage to God is the very act of being here together. Since one way to define homage is to show a demonstration of respect or dedication, we do that when we give our time 
and we dedicate it to the Lord to be here together and to worship Him. We demonstrate the importance that He has. We acknowledge the role that He plays in our lives and we confess our need of Him. We do that by being here, wait, with a worshipful heart. And just so you know, you can be here every Sunday and not give homage. I don't want you to walk away thinking that showing up is some little box you can put a check in, like, all right, got the homage taken care of, we're all good there. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. You may come because you are motivated by guilt. Oh, I really ought to be here, and so then you come. You may come because it's the expectation. It's what you are expected to do, and so you come. But then your motivations for being here are wrong, and you're missing the point. And if that's you, it's pretty difficult to actually worship if you're here non-voluntarily. If you're here out of a sense of obligation, out of a sense of guilt, rather than coming with a worshipful heart. You're not demonstrating his importance in your life. You're not acknowledging the role that he would play, nor confessing any need of him at all. It involves actively demonstrating respect to him. A second piece to that is that when we come together and give homage to him, it's like a multiplier effect. God is glorified by the individual and his or her efforts, to be sure. We spent a whole message talking about individual worship last time. So this is not, it's not like it's an either or thing. Not at all. It's a both thing. We just do them at different places. We come here for that corporate worship. So this idea of the multiplier effect is that we're, we're many voices. When service opens up and we pray as one body, God hears those voices lifted up as one. That's pretty cool. That's pretty special. And to have those, those power and numbers, it's a pretty amazing thing. As we close the prayer with an amen and give it as it was one voice, glory to God. And when we sing together, God gets the greater glory. The power is generated from many voices and is not to be discounted. You can ask my friend Gary about what it's like to hear a hundred men singing Good, Good Father as they worship together. Man, it is an amazing thing when you have that voices all coming together as one and all singing praise and honor to his name. Mm, what an amazing thing that can't happen if we don't come together. It's an amazing thing. When we sing together, God gets the greater glory. Continuing with the thought of singing, when those voices are combined, Singing praises to the Father, it is glory to God. And thinking about singing, while it's done in unison, it can be a powerful thing. But when we have the different parts, singing can become even more beautiful. I hope that you can appreciate music. Hearing a soprano and an alto combined with a tenor and a bass can be an incredibly beautiful sound. Singing solos are great, and solos are beautiful. Again, remember, we're not discounting anything done by an individual. What we're saying is God can get an even greater glory when we come together, and we have all of these different parts making a beautiful noise to the Lord together. God gets the greater glory from that. It's an amazing thing. And it happens when we come together and worship together. It's kind of like the multiplier effect. And that's what I mean by that. God desires to be known in this world, to be adored, and to be worshipped. God is a public God. We give homage to him 
when we sit under the public reading and teaching of his word. If I were in my house and I opened up my Bible and I started reading, as awful as this might sound, a stranger is not welcome to come into my house. I don't know who this person is. I am in my time with God, and why are you here? That's kind of not okay. On the other hand, if a stranger walks into this sanctuary right now to hear God's word, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That multiplier effect, the more we have, the more who hear, the more who come under the public preaching and the teaching of God's word is an amazing and a great thing. Reading and teaching his word publicly is exactly what Paul was instructing Timothy to do as Timothy was beginning his ministry in Ephesus in 1 Timothy 4, 13. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Now, I use the NIV here because I had to. I normally preach with the New King James. I study from the New King James. But interestingly enough, in that version and in the King James Version, the word public is omitted. But we do find it in the ESV and the NASB, and I use the NIV here. So it is here, and it's this idea that God's Word is meant to go out. It's not meant to be kept in and deliberated upon by yourself only. God's Word needs to be out there for people to hear. And when people hear God's Word and respond to it, who gets the glory? God gets the glory. And isn't that what we're to be doing here, giving God glory? And so we need this public preaching of the word. We need this because God is a public God. The third way that we can worship him is through celebration. Celebrations are always better when there are more to celebrate with. Nothing was quite so sad as when I was a bachelor and I would go out to eat and burger, party of one, yeah, that's me. And I would go trudge through and get my table and feel like, whether it was true or not, just feel like everyone is looking at me going, oh, that poor man all by himself. How miserable and sad he must be. And it was sometimes. <laughs> but celebrations are always better when you have more people to celebrate with. Anytime that we hold a gathering at our home, there's always this fear that I have. I don't know if my wife has it or not, but there's always this fear that I have that no one's going to show up. Then we'll put all this work in and we're ready to celebrate and have a great time, and instead it'll be just sad. So that said, while we are not talking about a party here, the principle is the same. When we celebrate as we do when we're here, it is better when there are more to celebrate with. And today, we celebrated the Lord's table. So I did not know when I was putting this series of messages together several months ago is when we first started. I think the first one was in February. We had one in April, and here we are in, this is June today, isn't it? June, we, we're now in June. All right, so when I put all these together, I had no idea when I was going to be preaching any of these. And so God in his providence worked it out that this message would be on the day that we have the Lord's table, which is in itself a celebration. So I mentioned as we were celebrating the Lord's table today that it's such a serious and somber occasion, so how can it be a celebration that's a good question. After all, we're remembering that Jesus suffered and died for us. It's a celebration because we have someone in Jesus who loved us so much that he was willing to endure the cross for us. Consider 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Our love does not 
end in tragedy. We celebrate because the love that led to his death did not end with his death. His love for us continues because he defeated death and continues to love us from the home where he now lives in heaven. We celebrate because it is through this that he might bring us to God. It's a celebration because without this, without what he did, what is our hope? What is our future? What do we have? Emptiness, promises that don't mean or add up to anything. So while, yes, it is a somber occasion, it is a celebration of an amazing, enduring, and unending love that God has for us. And so the final way that we'll look at our corporate worship time together is by proclamation. As we mentioned last time, these two, celebration and proclamation, can be tied together pretty closely. And so I'm going to go back to this. Worship is the central act of the church and the chief end of Christian life the central act of the church. As a body, we are here to worship. We are here to give praise to God. We are here to honor his name, to lift him up. That's why we're here. We'll finally come to the scripture that we've opened each of these last three messages with, and that would be Psalm 95. And we're going to look at the first seven verses of this psalm. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The height of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. What's happening here? Notice, this is not in the singular. It reads, let us. Let us. Let us come together and do what? Let us come together and shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. And do what? Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And why do those things? For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. That's why we're here. We're here to do those things. We are here to worship our God, and we have a way by which we can do that. So we're going to close our message a little differently today. We're going to practice what was just preached. Are you getting nervous? I'm going to ask you all to stand, please. We've just read Psalm 95, where we were given what to do. And from our previous message, we had Psalm 150. And in light of what we just read in Psalm 95, let's let our closing today be this shout of praise, of proclamation. Let us come together now, and let's together read Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. 
Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And you are dismissed. Thank you.